friends, it's so great to see you. Um, this is our May virtual salon for our No Due Date subscription book club. This month, we've all been reading Ludwig von Mises' Liberalism. And Pete and I are here with our good friend, Richard Ebling, who has lots to say uh, about Mises and his work. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we will follow our standard format of allowing uh, Pete and Richard to have some conversation, and then we'll bring all of you into the convo. Um, so Richard, thank you so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure to see you. And Pete, I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Amy. Um, I'm gonna start with an introduction of Richard uh, because um, he's not Ludwig von Mises, and we normally do these things with the author, um, but Richard is an expert. I have a mustache. I have a mustache. Yeah, yeah. He is a bb and Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Free Enterprise at the Citadel. Prior to that, Professor Ebeling was the president of the Foundation for Economic Education and the Ludwig von Mises professor at Hillsdale College. He also was a professor at Northwood Institute in Michigan. Uh, he's the author of numerous books and articles. In fact, you can see one of them in the back over his uh, ear there uh, uh, in the back in his library. Um, but uh, for our purposes, he's also the editor of the Liberty Fund, uh, three volume set on the selected uh, works of Ludwig von Mises. Uh, Professor Abeling uh, was a discoverer of Mises' lost papers <laughs> in Moscow. There's a whole story that's associated with that, which is quite fascinating. Hopefully, maybe some of you might be curious enough to ask about that. But when Professor Evelyn discovered uh, these Mises papers, they were that were first confiscated by the Nazis and then by the KGB. Um, he was able to unearth those, and then uh, part of those are in this volume that covers Mises' period when he was in Vienna. And so I'm really thrilled that Richard has joined us today, and I'm going to get started with some questions. But first, I want to welcome Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, for My doing pleasure this. to be here with you and to meet all of you. So this month we've been reading Mises' Liberalism um, as our as our book. And um, I'm going to ask, you know, obviously a series of questions about that. But I first wanted to just ask you about what drew your interest as a whole to Mises' architectonic system uh, that you have, in fact, worked in dissecting and being a scholar of for your professional career. Well, actually, you know, it, it was sort of an indirection in that uh, uh, back in the 1970s, a fellow named Jerome Tube Chilly wrote a book called It Usually Begins with Ayn Rand, which is actually a hilarious book. Uh, and uh, that's my story. I, when I was a teenager, I discovered Ayn Rand's writings, uh, actually first her nonfiction works, not her famous novels. And I just found it fascinating. And I started following the footnote references. Uh, and... Uh, Often she would footnote a variety of these books by this Austrian economist named Ludwig von Mises, along with, of course, Henry Hazlitt and, uh, and, and, and others, uh, Frederick Bastiat. And as a consequence, uh, I started just looking through that and I just became fascinated first to understand the, the, the case for a free market in conjunction with her theory of philosophy of freedom. But I just became fascinated with it for itself. It's why I ended up majoring in economics when I after high school when I went to college. And I just continued to pursue it, reading on my own, discovering the entire Austrian tradition, and uh, realizing that, that the fascinating thing about Mises is that at a relatively early age, um, he sort of got this grand vision, not all at once, not like you know, some one evening in his sleep, but over probably a short period of time, this grand vision of the nature of a liberal order and the economic undertaking of it. Uh, he writes in his own memoirs that he was reading in, I believe it was 1902 over the Christmas holiday, uh, reading Menger's Principles of Economics, his famous Grundsatz, which began the Austrian school, that, quote, made me an economist, unquote, he says. And that, that, that became the, the, the Archimedean point from which he then pursued all of these things. And I just found it fascinating of, of what a system builder he was. He, his system, in spite of some analysts and critics, it's not a closed system. It's not as if uh, you know he, you read Mises and there's every answer to every question. He, in, in spite of his rhetoric, sometimes he actually was a very modest and tolerant individual in a variety of settings. And uh, intellectual curiosity and intellectual growth uh, and 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 expanding of our theoretical and, and historical understandings was certainly one of them. And those are the kind of things that drew me to him. 
That's a, that's great. Actually, uh, on that last point, I remember Bettina Bien Graves, uh, you know, telling me that uh, one of the things that was most amazing about Mises, the teacher, was how he encouraged students in the class to ask questions. Uh, not only questions about, you know, just economics in general, but about his own arguments. And he never tried to any, you know, shut anyone down. He always engaged in, in, in always asking those questions and, and asking people to push, uh, you know, the arguments. Um, if, if I can just want, add one thing to that very point, Pete, if I may, is that I don't remember if he put it in one of his books or someone who was in his new NYU seminar told me this, but, but, but he, he said at one point in one of his classes, that none of them should be embarrassed or hesitant to make some statement or ask some question, because he could assure them that no matter how wrongheaded the, the view or the comment might be, don't worry, some great economist of the past shared that view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't worry yeah, yeah. about it. One of the things, again, I, I don't want to you know belabor this too much, but people can look this up. Be, be, uh, Bettina jotted down these lecture notes and one of them was all the research questions that yeah. Mises just gave away to the students in the seminar and yes. if you look at those research questions there are a variety of conceptual but it also empirical questions and everything like that it's a whole research program all of which is outside of you know some kind of closed system it's all about pushing the boundaries of understanding so i think it's very important to to uh, stress those aspects of Mises the the teacher and the scholar as, as uh, one of a lifelong learning. Um, and, and again, Pete, if, if you'll excuse me, just to add yeah. one more thing, is that one of the things that uh, were among his lost papers that uh, my wife and I, uh, and I couldn't have done it without my wife, Anna, who's Russian, uh, in that Moscow archive, among all of these uh, papers were practically all of his uh, uh, syllabi for the classes that he taught at the University of Vienna as a privat docent. And what stands out is that, you know, he of course would occasionally assign one of his own books, but it, it's a broad, whether it be a methodology of the social sciences, monetary theory, comparative economic systems, what today we call comparative economic systems. He'd give them a wide arena and circle of readings to do, having nothing to do with his views or the Austrian school. He wanted them to know and understand the, the entire breadth of perspectives and arguments that they should appreciate and understand before they came to their own conclusions. Yeah, just on that one last thing that I think studying the syllabuses of old professors is important. And there is a, a great resource for this. It's uh, by a guy named Erwin Collier, and he's uh, established a website called Economics in the Rear View. And he does a lot of archival research. But one of the things that's most shocking to you is pre-World War II, the Austrian school was not known as an Austrian school. It was just known as economics. And if you look at like the, the microeconomic syllabus that Milton Friedman had when Jacob Viner was his teacher, there's more pages from Bombavrik than there is from Marshall. And when you look at what, uh, Buchanan, when he showed up at Chicago in right after World War II, what was required reading to get your PhD at the University of Chicago, both Mises and Hayek, as well as uh, Bombavrik are on that list. Uh, as long as, uh, as along with Vixel and a bunch of other people. So the Austrians were just part of the common knowledge of what economics was. And it's only after Samuelson in the complete victory of the Keynesian apparatus after 1940s in the 1950s that the Austrians get pushed aside rather than being major players. And I think this is really hard for people that are not quite tied into that earlier history to remember and understand. And, uh, and so it is. It's, yeah, the one thing about that, Pete, it's to appreciate that it wasn't just the Austrians who were sort of uh, uh, lost in what one author called in the title of his book, the Keynesian avalanche. Yeah. Uh, this happened to a variety of other very good schools of thought. The Swedish or Stockholm School, which ran from Vixell through Myrdal, Lindahl, Lundberg, uh, or Bertello Lean. All of them in the mid, in the interwar period were developing dynamic process theories of industrial fluctuations, uh, the interactive processes of the market uh, 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 in general. And, and all of them just were, were, were crushed by, by that neoclassical uh, Keynesian revolution that dominated the profession in the post-World War II period. 
one last thing to the to the, the the audience here because there's a kind of a mythology that's that circulates in the libertarian circles, uh, which sort of makes it out that Mises, you know, was a martyr. In many ways, Mises was a martyr. I'm not trying to say he wasn't. It, you know, from my point of view, it's kind of like battles over who is the best basketball player in the world, and we sometimes forget like how good Will Chamberlain was because we don't pay attention to him anymore. So we look at everyone else and then you're like, next thing you know, we're having a list of great basketball players and Will Chamberlain doesn't show up. And you're like, hey, Will Chamberlain's, you know, not being recognized or whatever. The reality is that Mises uh, was a name, the distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association. They do not give that award out like candy to people, right? That means that you are the elite among the elite. You're in, a, in the you know, tail of a distribution of 1% of 1% of scientists. And Mises was in that. Uh, Jacob Viner actually, in a review of one of Mises' books, says, if you judge Mises by the influence he had on scientific contributions of his students, he's the greatest teacher of economics in the 20th century. You that know? was Henry, so, actually, Pete, that was Henry Simon's review oh, and, okay. of the government. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, so you have to understand, Mises is not, not a famous person in economics. And in fact, the earlier you get, the bigger he was in all of Europe. Uh, the issue is, is that he didn't speak English as well as Hayek. And so what happened was Hayek is 20 years is younger and Hayek gets a lot of the opportunities that Mises would have had, had Mises been better at English, but Hayek is better at English because he spent a year in the United States on Mises' suggestion and, and dying through getting him through the, the Rockefeller Foundation. And, and whatnot. And as a result of that, Hayek was more easily to integrate into the English speaking scientific community, whereas Mises's works get translated after Hayek is already in the English speaking world. So it's important to keep that in mind. Anyway, let's go back to the book. Uh, in the 1920s, Mises writes three comparative economics books, Socialism, which is his, his big book about the socialist system, Liberalism, which is the book that we're reading, and then a critique of interventionism. Uh, this is in 22, 27, and 29. And uh, what do you think was the main lesson that Mises is trying to communicate to his peers and to his audience about systems thinking uh, with regard to like the way the economic system is organized? I think he, he, by the time he had systematized his ideas with socialism in the very early 1920s, he had come to the conclusion that, um, that if you wanted to understand the practicability of a, a prosperous and, uh, and free society, one had to understand that there were certain institutional arrangements which were compatible with prosperity and freedom. Others were either less compatible or diametrically opposite. Uh, the market economy uh, by the ability with the institutions of private property and open competitive setting of prices for both outputs and inputs, uh, provided the ability for a rationality uh, to assure that the mean, the scarce means were applied in ways tending to be uh, used and applied in ways uh, that would best serve the demonstrated preferences of the consumers in their interest in buying things as expressed in, in, in the goods they wanted and the prices they were willing to pay for them. The rationality of seeing that the means followed that and reflected that was something that an open competitive market enabled with private property and the means of production, competitive pricing, and a medium of exchange through which goods could be reduced to a common denominator in terms of their values. Uh, that had a possibility which neither interventionism nor socialism could match. Socialism did away with the institutions of the market. Uh, if there is nothing legally to buy and sell, then there's no potential for higgling in the marketplace over what person what, what one person wants to buy and another might want to sell. If there's no higgling in the marketplace, there's no agreed upon terms of trade. If there's no agreed upon terms of trade, there's no uh, market generated prices. And without market prices, as Mises says, you do not have the compass on the base of which you can orient and direct all that goes in the complex social order. So socialism did away with the possibility for an efficient, effective, and free society. Interventionism was different in that it doesn't do away with the core institutions of prices per se or the 
private ownership per se, but it hampers it through, uh, on one side, uh, price controls, if those are imposed, which prevent prices, if to, if to put it this way, to tell the truth, uh, to inform people what it is they want and how the opportunity cost of using resources are uh, being properly expressed through the alternative bids of uh, rivalous entrepreneurs uh, wishing to employ them. Uh, or the government sets up regulatory rules and restrictions on how and what producers can manufacture and how they can do it. Uh, and this means that the entrepreneur is not, does not have the latitude and liberty to use his own knowledge and understanding of the market circumstances to best direct the means of production as he thinks will be profitable. Uh, and his motive and incentive for trying to get it more right than wrong is of course, he's investing his own capital, his own financial future, and uh, it is he who receives either the profits or suffers the losses, which if sustained means he goes out of business and must find a, a lesser role in the division of labor than as entrepreneur. Um, that means that at the end of the day, neither socialism nor interventionism is an effective alternative to an open and, a, and free competitive order. Uh, the other point was, is that uh, the very contradictions and inconsistencies of the interventionist system and he'd like to use price controls as the extreme example of this, is that when the government sets a price uh, to make it more palatable to certain segments of the society, it may very well be setting the price below the necessary opportunity costs or actual costs of the good. And as a consequence, that will result in a shortage. Um, we often draw these diagrams for our students on the board. If you set a price below the market clearing price, you tend to generate shortages. But that means that the intervener then has a decision, either recognize the errors of his ways and freeze the market, or he has to extend those controls from the retail market to the wholesale market, because the wholesaler is not willing to sell if the retailer can't pay a price yeah. to cover the cost of purchasing at the wholesale level. And if you control the wholesaler's prices, then you have to go backwards further and further into the factory production market. So that in a step-by-step -step piecemeal way, if the intervene, intervener, the political intervener is, is dogmatically insistent upon not giving up, uh, you end up basically with the economy over a period of time uh, under the in, entire control of the government because one control leads to another control leads to another control until finally there is no market-based price system for all intents and purposes uh, left for the, the, the society to rely upon. <laughs> People, uh... Uh, a, a relatively current example, and it's not really rel uh, current anymore, but it goes all the way back to, you know, Richard's own experience in post-communist Russia and my own experience in studying it. Um, I was, a, I was a, a, a fellow at the Academy of Sciences in Moscow in, in the early 1990s. And when I was there, there was this big battle going on between Boris Fedorov, who was the finance minister, and then this guy, Victor Chernil Muldrin, uh, you know, and they kept on fighting back about what the future of capitalism is. Chern uh, you know, Chernil Muldrin actually came out and said, the age of market romanticism is over. And that was only six months after the Soviet Union had fallen, right? So it's like, he was insane. But anyway, uh, they liberalized prices in uh, the uh, spring of 1992. Um, but by the end of the summer of 1992, all the prices were, in fact, now under control again. This is during the time, supposedly, they were following shock therapy. And it followed exactly Richard's uh, uh, line there, or Mises' line, because what went on was they originally freed up what they considered to be, um, you know, all goods except for essential goods. So what they considered was, for example, milk was supposed to be essential goods. So milk continued under its price control, all right? So just a few copecks or whatever. At the same time, uh, now think about it. If I'm a dairy producer, I have a choice. Do I produce milk at a controlled price or do I produce sour cream, which gets whatever the market can fetch? Well, what happens is they ended up by producing sour cream and not producing milk. So the shortage of milk got worse and the abundance of sour cream. And so then the government said, oh, we can't do that. So they tried to put quantity restrictions on. And so blah, 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 blah. And it all continues. This is exactly Mises' dynamics of interventionism story. So again, when people sort of say things like, oh, you know, Mises doesn't have any empirical component, it's like, 
come on now. It's like, right, look out the window. It's like living right in front of you all the time. And you can look at this with like, say for example, with rent control apartments in New York City and what happens on all the different margins with that. These are the kind of thing Mises is talking about in which the, the interventionism constantly is at odds with the goals of the intervener. So there's constant frustration, not only from the point of view of the consumers in the economy, but also from the point of view of the very people trying to promote the policies, right? Which is, it ends up by undermining- I just the mentioned that, that, that if, if you consider when Mises was writing this as ancient history, or even if you consider the post-Soviet experience immediately in Russia in the early 90s as too much of ancient history, Maybe some of uh, the, the participants caught it in the Financial Times yesterday, the day before, that uh, uh, a number of European governments are, are, are now have instituted or are thinking of instituting what they call price caps. They don't want to use the word control, price okay. caps, or, or restrictions on profit margins, because essential goods have been rising too much with the uh, recent price inflation. Well, you know, like causes bring about like effects. If they're, if they're insistent upon this, the shortages are going to replace the uncomfortably high prices and the situation that they want to alleviate it will only become worse. All right, let's get to the, the, the sort of, I wanna ask you this question about the book, which they've all read, which is that at various times in liberalism, uh, Mises says that liberalism is the consistent application of the teachings of praxeology to practical affairs. He also says that liberalism could be summed up in one word, which actually isn't one word, but it's called private property, uh, right? He also says that liberalism exhibits toleration, right? Um, he also says that the goal of liberalism, domestic and foreign, is peace. They're the same, right? And then the last one is that the true liberal is a cosmopolitan rather than a nationalist. They are a citizen of the world rather than of any one thing. So these are all very, very uh, explicit claims. They're very stark claims in a lot of ways. They're ones that I'm, in fact, extremely comfortable with. But how do you see yourself negotiating all of those different claims for the fundamental idea of a liberal order um, and, and how Mises was seeing that picture? Well, let's start with the first one, that, uh, that liberalism is sort of an application of the uh, teachings of uh, rightly understood economics. Yeah. Um, that's ba he's basically saying is that what the economist uh, enables us to, to understand and derive uh, certain fundamental laws of the social world, uh, that there's scarcity, that there's inescapable trade-offs, uh, that everything we do involves opportunity costs, and that therefore there will be differences and, uh, and tensions among individuals uh, for to achieve their goals and the decision of how best to use the means that are at various people's disposal. Uh, if you want an avenue that is likely to generate uh, all of those things, uh, peace, prosperity, liberty, toleration, uh, then the teaching of economics is that you're most likely to achieve these and some uh, most uh, possible, I'm not gonna use the word optimal, but possible combination uh, through the institutions of the marketplace. Uh, it's tolerant because each individual is left free uh, to pursue his own goals as he peacefully and honestly views them uh, uh, as, uh, as he sees it. Uh, he must use voluntary means in his association and interactions with others, uh, which means he has to uh, treat, treat them with respect and dignity and therefore toleration that they may value things and desire things differently than himself. Uh, that this is only possible in an arena of property. Uh, and uh, he uses the word property. I don't think he uses private property, but the passage you're referring to in liberalism, I think he just says property, but he means oh, yeah, private property. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and the thing is, is that uh, from a classical liberal perspective, as I view it, the most fundamental property that a person owns is himself, your mind and your body. So if we start with uh, the Lockean view that uh, each one has a, certain uh, inherent right, I'm not gonna use the word natural because that's philosophically very tension causing, but an inherent uh, commonsensical right to themselves uh, and the fruits of their own labor, uh, then that means that uh, following the Lockean logic that a person that either acquires uh, outputs 
through mixing his own labor with unclaimed land or using resources at his disposal and freely and honestly trading with others, uh, then, then, then property is the foundation of society. And property can only be secure, both in giving you that autonomy of respect and potential, as, as well as the incentives to be productive, if there's an environment in which property, both of the person and material things that they are uh, ethically and legally view, viewed as their own, to be respected and enforced. Um, and, uh, and it is cosmopolitan because the logic of the marketplace is not the laws of economic, the laws of, uh, of economics in the United States or the laws of economics in outer Mongolia. It's the laws of economics that apply to all human beings. And uh, one example of this is that at the end of his discussion of value theory in uh, the, the positive theory of capital, Bambavrik says that uh, long before economists discovered uh, the, the, the theory of marginal utility, as in farmers practiced it, which means it's just the way people act. And Mises in his own way repeats that in one of his essays. Uh, so this is the logic that applies to all people, the institutional order that is most efficacious for the betterment of all human beings regardless. And therefore the, uh, the, the liberal market order is both ecumenical and, and cosmopolitan. And if extended, the way I sometimes expend, uh, say this to my students, uh, Pete, uh, is that uh, let us suppose that eventually we find life on other planets, intelligent life on other planets. And, uh, and, and the, the, the division of labor that has gone from the community to the region, to the state, to, uh, to continents, to the globe, would then be possible to have a galactic division of labor in which all people would, would benefit through intergalactic <laughs> trade comparative advantage. Uh, so, so this is truly a, a, a view of the world that, 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 is, that, that, that is harmonious for all uh, conscious creatures. And I'm using that phrase because, you know, galactic trait, all conscious creatures. Can, can you just tell me real quick again, the reference to Bambavrik, where is that in Capital and Interest? Yes, it's in the Senholz translation. It's not in yeah. the William Smart translation um, because Bambavrik revised it. Uh, and uh, it's at the end, I believe it's at the end of the section on value theory. Before he gets to price, when he's explaining the law of marginal utility, okay, I believe great. that ends that section of, of the book that, that that's on value theory. Yeah, I, I'm fascinated by that because I'm, I'm intrigued by this notion of the idea of um, viewing economics from the inside out as opposed to economics from the outside in. And the idea that we as economists uh, in fact, begin, we, we philosophically reflect on a practice that already exists. So we did Adam Smith's, you know, uh, you know, baker, you know, brewer and butcher are already engaged in the division of labor before we as economists sort of Correct. study it. And that's totally different than the way in which Keynesian economists envision themselves as outside the system and tinkering and fixing it. Um, I, I, I also matters. use the analogy sometimes with my students speak. Uh, in trying to explain what we're talking about, as I say, you know, all of us in the classroom are speaking English. N none of us had to sort of learn the logic of the structure of the English language before speaking. So we sort of absorbed it and we learned it just interacting with our parents, our siblings, neighbors, family members. Uh, but, but, but by studying the, the, the structure of a language, you discover the logic of what you're doing, but which you do without thinking of it, about it. Uh, and the same thing is with the, I explained is what we're doing in the principles of microeconomics course, or at least a part of it, yeah. where it's the core logic of how an individual chooses and decides under scarcity. It's not like I'm telling you how to make your choices in some logical template sense. But in fact, that I'm bringing to the surface what you're already doing. Well, and, and, I, and I use that, I, I, I reference that, that motto with which Philip Wicksteed begins the common sense of political economy, in which he quotes Goethe, which loosely translated means we all do it, but few of us realize what we're doing. Yeah, no, it's, it's brilliant. Um, last question, because I want to get to everyone here and it's already 1232, which is as follows. Uh, and, and, and the people here should know this. You know, Richard, you've been a central actor in the revival of Austrian School of Economics from the very beginning, uh, all the way back to South Royalton, 1974. And you have been an active teacher. You've been, a, in fact, as a teacher, you influence generations of students who have gone on to become professors 
um, in your various different schools that you've taught at and everything. As the head of fee, you represented the classical, the oldest free market classical liberal institute. You were the head of that and you represented that, uh, uh, you know, with great effectiveness. Uh, now you're at the Citadel, you're a bb &T professor. Um, how fair is the revolution? <laughs> I think that if you compare it to 50 years ago, and next year is 50 years, <laughs> that's scary when I think of myself uh, having attended that first Austrian conference in uh, South You're only 10. You're only 10. Uh, yeah, I, I was a toddler. I was in diapers, yes. <laughs> man axe, man axe, man axe. <laughs> but uh, but um, when when that when that conference was held under the auspices of the Institute Remain Studies, uh, and and the IHS organization brought together, I what was it, about 40 people, I guess. Um, it's not an exaggeration to say that those 40 people, most of whom were graduate students with a few older people, um, that was the Austrian school in the sense of people who had discovered this on their own, often in ways that I did through libertarian or objectivist ideas. Um, and it was gone. Uh, the neoclassical Samuelsonian revolution of the Keynesian uh, avalanche had, had undermined all of it. There, there, were, there was no space for <laughs> uh, intellectual or theoretical toleration, since we talked about toleration, um, in, in the profession. And if you compare that then to today, uh, th th this has been an unbelievably blossoming, uh, not only a, a, a grand burst of literature in which the profession, the, the school at first was rediscovered. A lot of people over the first 10 years after that conference would say, oh, all the Austrians do is talk about the history of economic thought. The tradition had been lost, Pete. And for a time, you're rediscovering the old texts, like the archeologist who finds these ancient texts and has to read them and translate them and rediscover them, what the people were saying and thinking in that earlier time that in one level had almost been forgotten. So it was not surprising that for the first 10 years afterwards, there was this highlighting of emphasis on rediscovering the ideas of the tradition, a history of thought perspective. But since then, uh, the, 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 the uh, emergence of original works in monetary and business cycle theory, the theory of uh, the firm and the competitive market, uh, the influence that particularly under Kersner's inspiration has seen this blossoming of, of uh, an understanding of the meaning of entrepreneurship and not in a rigid way, because there have been different approaches building upon Kersner, uh, the, this emphasis on comparative institutions. Uh, and this, of, all, of course, has been greatly uh, accelerated and enriched. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to embarrass you now, Pete, that a lot of it is due to Peter Betke through his yeoman work at George Mason University in helping to build a, re a re revived Austrian school, cultivating and nurturing graduate students, helping them to get into positions. Peter Betke has done yeoman's work. I hate to embarrass you. I know people often don't like being given the pat on the back, but Pete, if there has been a revival of the Austrian school, the, the, one of the major players in this has been you. And, and in the history of the Austrian school, your, your place is, is, is a very prominent one, whether you wanna hear people say that or not. I certainly view it that way. Anyway, as, so uh, I've been very fortunate to have a tremendous amount of talented students that were cultivated by yourself and Walter Block and a bunch of other people who really turned people on to economics when you turn young people on to economics. Taylor yeah. will know this, right? It's it's those kids in the, when they're 18, 19 years old that they get excited about ideas. And so when Alice is teaching those high school kids, it's, it's teaching kids economics and having them fall in love with economics. And so much of our profession teaches economics in the worst possible way so that kids get bored by it. But you're one of the ones, and Walter, of course, has been, and now you're, you know, you're, you're, your colleagues at Hillsdale and other places down there at, at the Citadel, they excite young minds about economics. It's fascinating. So, yeah, and I'll just mention, if anyone is interested in what, what, how, what is, what, how is the Austrian school grown and what is it doing now? Uh, there's this very good piece that you just recently posted you, that you co-authored on, on you know, the, 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 the latest directions of the Austrian school, oh, getting yeah. the exact <laughs> title. And that's a great place to start to see where the Austrian school is today. You, 
So it's, a, it's a very useful paper, Pete. Thank you. I will say one thing to the audience here that's funny is that um, I was working on a paper separate from that with Roger Koppel at the Journal of Economic Literature. And uh, it was called Hayek's Unknown Knowledge Problem. And one of the referees said, which I thought was quite daunting, it, you know, this is an attempt to try to communicate to the economics profession sort of the value of Austrian economics at a theoretical level. This other piece is more about the, the value of Austrian economics as applied economics. But this other one, and one of the referees said, um, hey, you know, have the authors thought about the following is that Hayek has had a chance to try to tell everyone why Austrian economics is important. Uh, Lachman has had a chance to try to tell everyone why Austrian economics is important. Uh, Kersner has had a chance to tell everyone. Rizzo and O'Driscoll has had a chance. And Caldwell has had a chance. What makes you think that this paper is going to change the outcome when all those other people were there? And I'm like, because we got the right words. We just got to do it the right way. And anyway, that paper's not happening. Now. And so this other one, the other one happened. So this is the fate of, of our ideas. But anyway, thank you, Richard, for all of that. It's really just, um, you know, so rich to always talk to you about these ideas. And, uh, and hopefully in these Q&A, we can dig a little deeper into Mises's insights uh, from this book. So for those of you who are there, raise your hand function in the chat. Uh, you know, here, and we can start, you know, addressing questions to Professor Evelyn. Okay, Taylor, go ahead. Hi. Um, there are um, a lot of ideas in this book that, I mean, to me, it all makes a lot of sense. Um, and yet it seems to me, and I'm not a professional economist, but it seems to me that um, there's either resistance or ignorance in the professional economic community to, to some of these ideas. I mean, I was re reading something recently about um, arguments about now that, now that AI is progressing, couldn't AI do a better job of planning the economy than, um, than market forces? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be more efficient? Um, and uh, I think it was something by uh, Aaron Asimoglu, some argument on Twitter about yeah. this and uh, what he was saying about, uh, uh, it seemed to be a misunderstanding of Hyatt's uh, use of knowledge arguments. Um, it seems like if, if, if economists don't buy into this, it's hard to see how other intellectuals would buy into it. And ultimately, it, it, it seems, and I think that this comes up in several places in, in um, liberalism, that uh, if the public doesn't understand this and support this, it's really hard to, um, to bring about the liberal society. Uh, who speaks for these ideas, not the political parties, it doesn't seem like, um, because it's not about serving special interests. And who will be speaking to when we, when we try to convince people that this liberal idea is the best way forward. Uh, I know this kind of general comments, but uh, I'm just trying to see, you know, I understand Austrian school and, and these ideas are making some progress, but uh, my ultimate question is how do we reverse the direction we're going in now? That's, uh, that's, a, that's like the $64,000 question. But let me sort of uh, start where you began, uh, this business about artificial intelligence. Um, I think that those who see that this may be an avenue to overcome what they interpret to be uh, the knowledge problem as they're reading it in Hayek, uh, still is confused in that uh, they have not understood deeply enough in my view, what Hayek meant is to whom is the datum known? They're still thinking that there's all these little bits of knowledge that are in a sense measurable, quantifiable, collectible, uh, that seem to be impossible to do and to constantly be digesting, that, uh, that, 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 uh, that these super high-speed computers with, through the use of uh, sort of like an artificial brain, a central planning brain, could successfully do it. But uh, the, the fundamental aspect of this, uh, and maybe I'm wrong, uh, is, is, is the subjectivism that the Austrians have emphasized. The, the fact is the datum doesn't exist until an individual imagines. Uh, 
evaluates, decides what he values more highly and less highly, the ends that he might want to pursue, uh, evaluates what he sees in his uh, area of uh, observation in that generic sense um, of possible means and uh, what he views as the opportunity costs of using them for alternative purposes given his judgments as to what he prefers more and less. So that the datum that they're dependent upon for AI to utilize is not even collectible and usable or interpretable uh, un until an individual has decided this. In other words, the originating data cannot be an AI. And since that data is always potentially changing and unknowable in the quantitative or measurable sense, because it's in your head, man, it's in your head, man. I, 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 I told my students that, and I, I always sound like a 1960s hippie. Hey, man, it's all in your head, man. But it is. It's all in our heads. It exists there. It's, it's sort of like the, the old comment that, 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 that Max Weber meant, uh, made in one of his discussions of the subjective notion of meaning or interpersonal meaning, is that an active exchange that we observe in the transfer of two goods really is the culmination of a prior exchange. And that is a decision in the minds of each respective participant that they value A more than B or B more than A. Uh, unless that, until that mental act has occurred, there's nothing observable that will be a reflection of it. Um, and if we understand this, there is no way that AI can do better than the market because the market is the instantaneous reflector of people's changing evaluations, judgments, and willingness to follow courses of action in one way or the other. In other words, AI always has to be one step behind letting people do their own acting and choosing and interacting because AI can't do anything in terms of new datum until new datum has been arisen in the minds of the participants. Um, I know that that's probably not teasing out all of what I kind of see here as a crucial problem with it, uh, but I think that, that it's an essential one. The subjectivism of the data, that is, it begins in, in the minds of 8 billion people in various and sundry ways, and momentous and mundane, uh, marginal and increment and, and categorical uh, in, in ways that, that only the market can, can astutely absorb and adjust to in a way that AI can never effectively do. And in that sense, if I've understood uh, the AI argument correctly, uh, that they will all suffer from, from the shortcoming of for, to whom is the datum known and then initially acted upon uh, the way I think Hayek was gra grappling at and I believe would be part of his response in my judgment if he was alive to discuss AI today. One of the things I just would point everyone here to is Richard's work in the 1980s um, along with Don Lavoie's on uh, uh, highlighting this interpretive dimension of economics and the importance of how prices are understood as these interpretive signals. Um, it's built on this idea. There's a, a, a very interesting passage in Hayek's Counter-Revolution of Science, in which he says that the reason why Mises is difficult for people to sometimes grapple with is that he was so far ahead of everyone else in the science in the consistent and persistent application of subjectivism. And that every advance in economics that has taken place since the classicals has been due to the advancement of subjectivist perspective in economics. And what Richard and Don Lavoie did was they try to recapture that idea and really stress that a lot. Um, and, and that work is very, very uh, important for us to understand what markets do. Um, so yeah. Yeah. if I can just sort of, uh, I, I know you everybody wants to have a turn. I don't want to monopolize answering one person's question, but if I can just take the second part of uh, his question, and that is how do we make the argument effectively and persuasively enough to change the direction of policy? This is a problem that not just Austrians have. I mean, think if you're, if you're a Milton Friedman, yeah. uh, who is unbelievable if you watch the old YouTubes when he was at the height of his powers, he's unbelievably ar uh, argumentatively persuasive. And, and colloquially pleasant most of the time in these videos. I mean, he was, he was, he was a great rhetorician in this sense. Um, and he had his frustrations too. 
uh, it led uh, George Stigler to become totally cynical, saying the economist doesn't matter because people are not going to ever listen to economists. So whatever occurs in the world, it's the best of all worlds because that's what people want because they don't listen to economists about what they how the world works. Uh, but uh, th the problem is, and in fact, I was just rereading an essay by a 19th century liberal named George Goshen, um, who, if people remember him, he wrote a book in the 1860s on the theory of foreign exchanges that was considered great at the time. But he has an essay on um, laissez-faire versus government intervention. Uh, and then he lays out why, why the case for intervention is so appealing. The arguments are exactly the same as today. Uh, and he wrote this in 1883. And uh, but the, what he emphasizes is that the problem that the advocate of, of, of the free society, the liberal free society has, is that it requires people to think. <laughs> and it is easier for the critics of the market to rely upon the immediacy of emotions. Oh, there's a starving person. Shouldn't we help him? Oh, there seems to be a guy who's, who's making big profits and there's no other competitors to compete them away. Oh, oh, uh, the, the inequality of income seems so unfair because the rich guy has more and the poor guy has little. Uh, and it's the emotive aspect that, that is probably the hardest thing to get over. And Mises talks about this towards the end of liberalism, where he, where, where he says is that, uh, that ultimately it's only reason and logic that can make the argument. If we try to be a demagogue and try to fool people into supporting freedom, at the end of the day, it won't work. But the fact is, is that at, there occur these, these revolutions and ideas where the market catches on. People see the value of it, the, the significance of it. And then there's this counter-revolution, which is going on right now, unbelievably, all around the world against market liberalism. Uh, but there's a can, can, constant battle, and maybe it's, it's inherent in the human circumstance that we are both rational creatures and, and emotional creatures. And as long as this tension exists, the battle between freedom and collectivism, uh, the market versus centralized planning, the immediacy of, a, of looking for an answer versus the long run role of understanding institutions and incentives will always be with us. Victoria? So, so I could spend an hour talking about um, the market process. That's um, such a good such a good topic, but I was focusing, um, you know, I was taken by the chapter on political parties and it really just hit home at the end of that chapter. You know, he says liberalism serves everyone, but it serves no special interest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being an outsider to, you know, to academic economics, you know, it really hit me that this is a philosophy of a way of life. It's not, you know, just about economics. And so my question to you is how do we um, re, you know, rebrand this philosophy so it's more acceptable to all political parties instead of it being sort of categorized at, at, at a niche political party um, and just broaden, broaden the view so it's more acceptable to more people or Okay, now I'm, I'm obviously, you know, answering a question like that is like, obviously I'm not answering for Mises, I'm answering for myself, if you'll permit me to. Uh, but, but to me, it ultimately requires us to extend to the political arena in a way that it more or less was in the past, to extend to the political arena what we take for granted as the everyday rules of interpersonal just conduct in our personal and social settings. Uh, we take for granted that if we see someone drop their wallet, we return it to them. If we see a car that has an open window and well, they used to have keys for ignitions, but they see the key in the car, you don't steal the car. Um, even though you, you know you could get away with cheating somebody, eh, eh, you know you shouldn't. In other words, these embedded so interpersonal socialized rules of, of just conduct, uh, which does not apply to politics. It did in the past to a greater extent. Um, one of the fascinating things is to read accounts that Europeans wrote after long visits in the United States in the mid 19th century. And how much embedded in the American character was that government was not to interfere, government was not to give privileges or favors, even if it went to me, even though of course those corruptions were going on, particularly at the state levels back then. Uh, but that, that, that it was a way of life. 
you were an individual, you were self-supporting, uh, you dealt with people on a fair basis of meaning mutual agreement, uh, and, and you didn't use the state uh, to benefit others. And if people did, you frowned upon it and considered not the role of government. Uh, that got transformed for various and sundry ways in the late 19th and beginning of the 20th century. Whereas the, 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 the ethics of individual life is no longer viewed as uh, the, the same ethics in political life. And that's what we have to make people understand that, that what you consider right and wrong in your own conduct towards other people, even strangers, should be the rules of ethical conduct that applies in the political arena in which you are uh, with, with, with groups dealing in, with, with other strangers who you want to take advantage of. Richard mentioned uh, Milton Friedman. I recommend that everyone look at the Free to Choose Network has now brought out a summary of all of his uh, lectures that were part of the Free to Choose TV series called Free to Choose in Two Minutes. And the very first one is about immigrants. That's how he starts. And one of the things he says is exactly what Richard just pointed out. He said the immigrants came to America. They did not expect anything from the government, but they also expected the government wouldn't get in their way uh, 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 of being able to start a business and things like that. And that's how the immigrant experience you know, Friedman, Friedman glorifies in 1890s, early 20th century. Um, that's the very beginning of the Free to Choose uh, uh, series. So, Ryan? Yeah, um, on page 61 of liberalism, uh, Mises describes liber uh, liberalism as an ideology based entirely on scientific grounds. Um, and he downplays or ignores things like morality and culture, uh, which I think uh, might be part of uh, his persuasive problems that he and a lot of us liberals have experienced over the years. Um, are there other places where Mises uh, had a more nuanced view, a more inclusive view of, uh, of liberal rhetoric? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, what he was searching for, you know, the, my, my reading of him, when he was writing his book on socialism early in the 20s, and it carries over, of course, with his book on liberalism, uh, he's trying to find a, a benchmark in the context of which he can reply to these critics of the market order on non-normative grounds. Yeah. In other words, you know, gravity exists. Uh, if you eat poison, you're going to die. Those are just you know, natural law, physiological circumstances. So if you don't want to, if you don't want to, if you don't want gravity to pull you down after stepping off a high cliff and kill you, if you don't want to die of eating the wrong kind of food, then this is the way you have to live. And this is what's required to live this way. Uh, so it's an argument over uh, the right institutional means to achieve uh, virtually everybody's uh, uh, not uncommon ends of peace, prosperity, having a better life for your kids, which he just takes for granted. And that's why he reasons this way, um, very uh, antiseptic, if you will. However, it's, his, it's the influence of his utilitarianism, but he's a utilitarian who he realized cares passionately about liberty in itself. He has these other essays in which he will say, um, the, the, uh, liberty is, is Western, by which he means in the history of Western civilization, he goes back to the Greeks to the Romans, the sense of a value to, to the individual, a respect for uh, the, the, the thinking of freedom of conscience of the individual, these more you know, normative elements of, of the goodness of things. But, but he, his, he chose to not reason that way because he then said, well, I believe in these values, you believe in those values, who are you to tell me I can't, I'm not right. Oh, gee, it sounds like today with all the relativists. But anyway, uh, but he's, he's, he's trying to say, no, regardless of the end you have in mind, which we all sort of share generally, except for the psychopath, um, there's only certain institutional means to get there. Now, it may involve a longer horizon than your emotive reaction wants you to be able to solve, but there's only one institutional way. And therefore, the liberal ideal is based upon this idea, which we talked about earlier with Pete, on the laws of economics. That, that's what he means by that. Um, it makes it more difficult. Uh, the, the problem is, is that at the end of the day, in my opinion, there has to be that passion for the ideal of liberty. As I sometimes put it, 
nobody bears their chest at the barricades in, in the defense of freedom when freedom is defined as a 1% decrease in a tariff. You, you do it because you believe in the, uh, the, the, the dignity of the individual, the, 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 the right of the individual to think freely, act freely, live freely, give meaning to his own life, and to be left alone to do so as long as he honestly does it in his dealings with others. Uh, it's that passion that's, that, that, that is part of liberty, in my opinion. But Mises was writing at a time when he was trying to, 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 to drain that, that, that what he considered the irrational passion of the lefties to say that there is a scientific basis upon which we can say, um, given the nature of, you, uh, nature of man and the social order, that these are the institutional circumstances that must exist. Otherwise, you're not, you're, you're not going to achieve even the goals that you say you want to attain. But, but I understand what you're saying. And at, at one level, I, I totally agree with you. Um, Alice? Hi. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, much as I'd want to ask the question and hear about the lost papers of Mises and your story behind that, um, I do want to ask a different question and maybe quickly to be advised about where I could read more. Um, and it's... Um, Mises on public funds being uh, kept as far away from education as possible, um, and a quotation from page 85, a healthy illiterate is always better than a literate cripple. I want to know how that sits with you. Um, uh, even Adam Smith would not uh, uh, be all over that. And uh, to direct me to more reading on von Mises on education specifically. What he's referring to is the context of the Central and Eastern Europe uh, of his time. Now, the emergence of nationalism in the late 19th and early part of the 20th century, uh, this idea of uh, the ethnicity and your language defined you, of which one variation, of course, became national socialism, Nazism, sort of like the extreme version of that and its consequences. Uh, what, 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 what was that if there was, if there was if there were ethnic or linguistic minorities in your surrounding geographical area, uh, you imposed compulsory education to force them uh, to be emerged in your larger majority uh, cultural or ethnic environment. Think of what the Chinese are trying to do today with the Uyghurs and out in Xinjiang in, in Western China or what they did to the Tibetans, which is just as ghastly. Um, if we cannot make you an ethnic Han, that is ethnic Chinese, then we will do it through a re-education uh, of language, culture, religion, de-religifying you uh, uh, to make you the same as us. Um, and Mises considered that this type of idea that, that, that of, of ethnic and linguistic and cultural majorities versus minorities constantly battling and trying to use school to destroy the other group to, to commit cultural and linguistic genocide, to use the term that's become more common now, uh, what, what, what was the breeding ground of war, the breeding ground of war. So what would be, what would be worse, that some peasant never learns how to read or write, or that he or his children become the cannon fodder in an unending struggle of tribes? Uh, linguistic and cultural and ethnic tribes. And that, that's what he means by that in the context of the Central and Eastern Europe in, in which he was living and writing. Um, he, he talks about that a little bit again in, um, in one of the essays that's in volume three of the selected writings of Ludwig von Mises that I edited for Liberty Fund, uh, always for the translations, uh, though that one was in English. And it's on uh, an Eastern European Union. It was the idea that uh, how will the Eastern European countries in the post-World War II period be able to protect themselves from both internal fights and external threats? And he talks about this, well, basically thinking like a Eastern European combination of an EU and a NATO. Uh, but there he talks about how education would be totally privatized, precisely so these types of issues cannot arrive where uh, uh, individuals would decide what education they wanted for themselves and their children. Uh, and by depoliticizing it, uh, you took the violence out of it. A modern version of this would be with compulsory education in the United States would be, well, do we salute the flag at the beginning of the school day or not? Do we learn evolution or creationism? 
uh, shall we have uh, as, a, as an historical text about the origins of America, uh, the 1619 project or a traditional notion of the, the role and the historical importance of the Declaration of Independence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As long as you have compulsory education, it means that schools monopolized. If schools monopolized, then uh, it's, it's either the people that you put into the Board of Education or that the other side gets in the Board of Education that dominates and controls and tries to affect the minds of your children uh, in the ways that they that, that you want as opposed to the other parents. Uh, and that, that's the kind of tensions and, and irreconcilabilities as long as there's a monopoly institution imposed on all that Mises is trying to get out there. I, I uh, Alice, there's a fantastic uh, documentary a biopic uh, series on National Geographic about Einstein. And as we've all heard, you know, Einstein faced a lot of troubles, but it, it's exactly what Richard is talking about. When Einstein was trying to uh, push through his ideas, revolutionary ideas in physics, it was the establishment that said it was not German physics. Einstein was not doing German physics because theoretical physics wasn't German physics. And therefore, Einstein shouldn't have a, a place. And so that's what pushed him aside until his theories were so dominant that he was able to come, uh, come in. But this series is very useful because it, one, shows this challenge that Einstein faced, which was based on sort of odious nationalism and racism. But also it shows the uh, misogyny of the time, because in many ways, Einstein got his ideas from his first wife. Uh, and she was like this major person and everything like that. But the fact is, is that, you know, she couldn't even be acknowledged even by him. And she was treated rather shabbily by him. And eventually she had all kinds of problems. But it's a very good series because it tells it all warts and all. And it's very shocking, I think. Yeah. Uh, wow. Thank you. But it, it gives us a mindset of what's going on at that time. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, Richard's right that this is we're reliving all these things right now. I don't know if anyone woke up today to hear what the governor of North Carolina did, but the governor of North Carolina declared an emergency, a state of emergency, because the Republicans in the House, in the Senate, state Senate, wanted to push through a school choice uh, initiative, and the governor stopping it as a state of emergency, claiming that protecting public education is as important as protecting, like, say, our roadways when we're hit with a tornado or whatever. Um, and there's something very bizarre about that use of the state, but it gives you what politics is naked and raw. And so, yeah, anyway, that, that, I'm probably being a little too biased in that, but you know. All right, uh, Barry, you have the last question. Uh, thanks, Pete. Um, just want to follow up on, on that sort of naked politics bit. Um, at the start of chapter five in Future Liberalism, um, Mises sort of talks about how modern civilization will not perish unless it does so by its own act of self um, destruction. And it's a sort of, and it's an enemy from within type issue that it's it basically an anti liberal um, ideology hostile to social cooperation. And, and then on sort of page 159, he's talking about how liberalism actually demands democracy and uh, sort of democratic norms and i've been recently reading um ann applebaum's twilight of democracy which is well worth having a look at that it that is basically an argument that the sort of those sort of liberals broadly defined and sort of centrist need to be sort of almost clubbing together right left center against the sort of populist attacks in, in America, in Europe in particular, and elsewhere around the world to just defend those those norms of um, democratic um, interaction and that liberal sort of um, sort of dialogue that we've we've been talking about. And so Mises seems really quite potently um, sort of um, topical in, in 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 this language. It's it's what um, sort of seems to be going on at the in the world at the moment. So it, it really does seem to be speaking to us rather than just being something of, of its time. Yeah, it, it, you know, Pete, uh, by talking about you know the revival of the Austrian school at the beginning. Uh, reminding me how old I am. Oh my God, half a century ago, I was at the first Austrian conference. Ah, can you talk louder, Sonny? Uh, <laughs> uh, in, in my lifetime, 
uh, I've noticed a change. You know, when I was young, it sounds terrible, in an earlier century, oh, it's even worse. Uh, when I was young, obviously there were Republicans and Democrats. There were conservatives in the, in the American sense, liberals. They argued, they debated, but there was a wide consensus uh, remaining of the institutional order and the rules of the game. Um, a respect for the constitution, for the bill of rights, uh, a toleration for dissent and disagreement, uh, obviously an openness to a wide variety of views on college campuses, uh, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, defending the Nazis to march through Skokie uh, 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 in, in Illinois, which was at that time a very highly concentrated Jewish community, many of, with some people who had survived the Holocaust. But the idea is that no matter how repugnant, uh, a free society must tolerate uh, e even those they hate and who would like to do away with the institutions of a free society, the right to practice those civil liberties. Uh, and that has been whittled away um, so that, you know, I'll let you, you, if you lose an election, you say it's been stolen. You know, in 2000, uh, Bush became president instead of Al Gore. And everybody, uh, you know, before 9-11, the first, what, eight months of 2001, uh, the polls showed that half of the, 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 the country did not view George Bush as a legitimate president. Why? Because of the hanging chads that had to be decided in Florida as in the voting booth of, that the Supreme Court had to decide the outcome of the election in terms of electoral college votes. And uh, but 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 at that time, you know, nobody thought of, you know, oh, he's an illegitimate president. We have to overthrow it. Uh, when I talk to my in the American sense, liberal friends, Democratic friends, uh, I would say, you know, this happens, you know, get over it. There's an election in four years. You have another chance. Just live with it. People don't want to live with this anymore. Uh, they, Trump was viewed as an illegitimate president because uh, 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 Hillary Clinton had won more of the popular vote. Uh, now, now, now the, 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 the Trumpites say it wasn't a legitimate election um, the last time because Trump insisted that if he didn't win, he could only not win if the election was stolen. Uh, th th there's, this, there's this consensus in behavior and attitude uh, in a breaking down of respect for, belief in, and and willing to endure uh, disappointing outcomes in the political uh, uh, democratic process that is very damaging and very dangerous. Uh, I'm not saying that we're going to fall into some type of fascism or socialism in, in the totalitarian sense, but it, 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 the institutions are being weakened. It doesn't mean they're going to disappear. There are times when things seem like we were in twilights against liberty and freedom before. But th these are, are dangerous and, and disturbing times, in my view. Uh, that's Thank fantastic. Um, it's, uh, not, I don't mean it's fantastic that we're having this despondent position, but it's a great <laughs> note to, to end on. Um, I will point out, and in, in, in maybe in a year or so, in another no due date, um, uh, this guy, Eric Beinhocker, has been working on a book in which he looks at the way in which um, the social trust in these various institutions, in politics and law and society, are all collapsing. So it starts with a loss of, of, of uh, trust in religion, then a loss of trust in the state, a loss of trust in the legal system, a loss of trust. And he says the last one is a loss of trust in science. And when the trust that goes, then the question is, what happens in that kind of world that we then live in? And I think it's a very interesting question for all of us to grapple with and how it is that you can uh, see liberalism as a solution to some of those ideas and, and how it is that we might, uh, you know, push for that again. But, um, but yeah, but we, these are, thank you so much, Richard. And thank you all of you for uh, participating in this and, um, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and next month, we'll have uh, another conversation, uh, this time with the actual author, not just the expert on an author. So but, it was my pleasure uh, to be with you here, Pete. And don't forget that because I said those nice things about you earlier. Don't forget to send the $5. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I, think I will go for more, Richard. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Those are worth a lot more. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Amy. I turn it back over to you.
Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. What a great conversation. As usual, we will take all of those links and comments in the chat and we will post them in our portal. Um, we'll be we'll start posting Pete's questions for our next book, uh, which is Chris Coins in Search of Monsters to Destroy starting soon. And we'd love to see some conversation with all of you in the portal uh, before we get to our virtual salon at the end of next month. In the meantime, Richard, thanks again for joining us. That was terrific. Thanks for all of you for giving of your time in reading and conversation. Our video will be posted in the portal as well for those who weren't able to join us today. And we'll see you next month. Happy reading. Thank you, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. By the way, the quote, just for those of you who are still listening, the quote in search of monsters comes from John Quincy Adams. And it's in it's a Fourth of July uh, lecture that he gave or speech that he gave as Secretary of State, and it relates to what it is to be America. And his whole point is Americans don't go looking abroad for mo monsters in, in search of monsters to destroy. And in fact, if we do, we end up by killing what America is all about. And America is about an ideal, not a place. And and Quincy Jones understood. Or Quin, Quincy yeah, Quincy Adams understood that. Quincy Jones is a jazz musician, right? So anyway, that was an anyway, excellent. Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> All righty, Richard. Thank you so much. For doing my this. pleasure. Yeah, my best. Thank you. Thank you. My best you Anna, okay. I will. Likewise. All right. Take care, everybody. Yes, Take care. See you.